Tonight is a very special night because tonight, or really today, is the anniversary of the Rebbe and the Rebbetzin. So it's very special. We always try to find really special opportunities and times that we can talk about relationships that are opportune times. So I thought it would be really nice to have a class about dating, about being realistic with our dating. Now, there are a lot of different ways that I could have gone talking about this topic tonight. And it was very, very difficult for me to try to figure out how to really talk about it in a way that would be meaningful, that would be special, that you could really gain from it. So I could start talking about, let's say, the process of dating, what I think is important. And I'm going to try to get to, you know what, based on what you told me before, as we open tonight's talk, I'm going to try to approach it from a different, couple of different perspectives. So the first thing is, people always ask me, what do I think is important when you're dating? I think that your dating should not be a survey. You should not be talking to every person you know about your date because it's going to really cloud your understanding and your idea of who you're dating. I say that you should have three people, three people in your dating process, aside for obviously you and the other person that are dating each other. You should have a matchmaker. Now I say a matchmaker, but it's somebody who their job is to push your dating along. Otherwise, it could get very stale very quickly. The second person is a mentor. And the mentor has a specific job. They are someone who you trust, that you really trust. And you trust every single thing they say. When they say it, you trust that it's true. You listen to them. It's not a survey. It's not an idea. I'm going to go to someone for advice. No, you really trust them. They know you and you know them. And you go to them as your sage, as your mentor to ask that person for advice. And then there's a peer, a friend. Somebody's on the same level as you. This person's job is not to give you advice. This person's job is to talk it out with you. Someone who you can talk it out with. You're almost, if, if someone asks you, if you're a friend of someone and they ask you, can you be my, can I bounce my dating issues off of you? You just are supposed to spit back whatever they say. It's, it's a sounding board for them. Not an advice. The advice they get from their mentor. You are just there to be their equal. To share that space with them. So three things. A matchmaker, someone whose job is to push the match forward. A mentor, someone whose job is to give advice. And a friend. To the exclusion of everyone else. Nobody else. Now, you're going to say, what about my mom? What about my older sister? What about... Wonderful. I'm proud of you. They can be one of those three. That's it. So if you want your mom to be in that place to be able to be your mentor, your mom could be your mentor, but that's your, but that's your mentor. That's your person. And listen to whatever they say. If you want your mom to be your friend, if, you're in, if, if, that's, your, if that's your experience, if that's you, what you share, then that should be what you do. Somebody asked here, how do we deal with people's preferences for in-person dating if one is not comfortable dating in person right now due to COVID and the other person is more comfortable? Well, I think that what COVID has done for us is COVID has cut all of the garbage away. And now we've gone right to the truth. Are you flexible or are you, are you not flexible? Can you deal with this or not? Nobody expected this. And somebody, for the right reasons, are, they don't want to meet in person. So can you do this? Can you transcend the Zoom experience? Look, I, I'll give you, I, I can send you a list of games that you can play on Zoom. Zoom is possible. There's no question about it. If that is your reality, if that's what you want, then that's what you may have to do right now. And there's nothing you can do about it. 
So if you're so stuck in your ways, somebody said to me, I don't look good on Zoom. Okay, and so what are you gonna do? So you're, so you're not dating right now, that's it, it's all off. Um, I, will, I will send you a list of games to play on Zoom. I'll send it in my follow-up email. What if the matchmaker pushes it, but your mentor says no? No problem. The matchmaker's job is to push it. That's the matchmaker's job. If the mentor says no, and you are listening to the mentor, then it's no, and that's it. You say to the matchmaker, I'm really sorry, but no. That's the reality. I'm really sorry, but my, my mentor, we spoke it over. That's why you need that support person. The job of the matchmaker is to push the match. The matchmaker should always be saying yes. That's the matchmaker's job. How long do I suggest dating virtually? Won't there be Zoom fatigue at some point? Um, yes and no. I mean, it really depends on what your end goal is. If you're dating seriously and your end goal is marriage, I don't see why there should be Zoom fatigue. I think that you need to think about what, your, what the point of your dating is and why you're dating. I think that's more of where our minds and our thought process should be. Now, something else that I want to talk about is about the person you're actually dating. You have to ask yourself some very important questions. Can you see the faults in the person that you're dating? Very often, I find that we romanticize our dates. There are two things that I see. So I set up people. And because some of these people, let's say, have had their heart broken so many times, what ends up happening is they create this automatic defense mechanism. They say to themselves, this is not going to work. And really, it's just a defense. It's just this, this, this defense that says, I don't want to have my heart broken again. So the person will spend three days before they go out making sure that they know exactly why it's not gonna work. And it's what I call a self-fulfilling prophecy because guess what? They go on the date and it doesn't work. So you're going to make sure that it's really not going to work and guess what happens? You actually go out with the person and it doesn't work. Voila, shocker, amazing. Of course, you knew it wasn't gonna work. And it doesn't work because you decided before you even started that it wasn't going to work. So you check them up on Facebook and on Instagram or wherever else you checked them up and you made sure that you knew their whole story so you can corroborate why it's not gonna work when it doesn't work. You need to make sure that you think that you know your, in their entire life based on their Facebook posts. So everyone starts worrying, what am I posting? What does my social footprint look like? And it becomes this whole cycle, this dating game. Oh, I hate the dating game. Why are we doing this dating game? There's, then, then there's the opposite of a dating game. There is the romantic. I'm going to romanticize this and it's gonna be wonderful and it's gonna be great. It's gonna be amazing. And then what happens then? All of their expectations get broken. Somebody just before this class started sent me a very similar question to the one that I'm going to talk about right now. And what I say to this person, what I'm going to say to you is that don't live with your relationship in your head. There are so many people who date people in their head. I mean, to the point where sometimes it's so much in your head the other person has no idea that you're even dating them. So what you're doing in that space is you're dating a fantasy and not a person. You're married to a fantasy, this idea of a person, not who that person is. I can't tell you how many people, and even though you dated the person, I don't know, a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, they're still in your head. You never got over them. And because you never got over them, you're, you're not willing to move on. And you think that you moved on, but you really didn't move on. It's not fair for you to be dating someone else when you're dating somebody else in your head. 
If that, if you're still thinking about that person all the time, then you're making a mistake. You have to get that out of your head. And obviously I'm talking about two different extremes. We already decided before this class started that I'm gonna lay it down hard. So I'm gonna do that. So if, if I'm not talking about anyone in specific, but if you happen to see that some of the things I'm talking about coincide with some of the things that you uh, have experienced or think about, well, let's just say it's divine providence. Now, I have to generalize because we're not just the two of us talking here. I'm gonna try, but we're not just the two of us talking here, so I have to generalize. So let's, let's try this. Instead of starting from the beginning, I'm gonna start from the middle and let's see if we can work our way out, okay? Let's talk about infatuation. I've spoken about this before, but I think that it's really important to discuss this on its own level when it comes to dating. Now, as, as part of the infatuation, you might end up convincing yourself that the object of your affection is perfect. And there's usually three reasons why someone would convince themselves that the object of their affection is perfect. Number one is you just met the person and you don't know any of their faults. So I'm not talking about the person who spent three days figuring out why it's not gonna work. I'm talking about the person who's romanticizing the relationship. So you just met the person, you don't know their faults, you don't know who the person really is. And the odds are that you may or may not see a part of them that is the wrong part or the right part, depending on where your focus is. If you're focusing on the negative, you're gonna see all the bad stuff. But if you're focusing on the positive, then you're just gonna see everything is wonderful. And all of a sudden, all these things that, that are red flags or not red flags, they just kind of go to the wayside. And you may also see a part of them that they don't wanna show you. And even if it's perfect, even if your first date goes perfect, I'm a huge fan of not allowing just one date. Don't allow one date. There is no way to unawkwardize. I'm making up that word. There's no way to unawkwardize a first date. It's gonna be awkward no matter what you do. It's, it's strange, two people, two different people trying to, to figure out their life together. I mean, there's really no way to make that not awkward. So if you're constantly basing it on a picture or swiping right or swiping left, or you're basing it on a profile or you're seeing someone, it's just, I mean, first of all, who looks good in a picture? That's number one. So I wouldn't want someone to judge me based on my picture. Why would you want them to judge you based on your picture? Am I muffled again? Better? Okay. You know, I wouldn't want them to, to judge me based on my picture. So why would you want them to judge you based on your picture? So don't, I, I, I get so upset when people say, I don't like the way the person looks. Well, how do you know how the person looks? Because you saw their profile picture? Really? That's how you're gonna do it? I mean, I spend time, I think about a match. No, it's not for me. Why? Based on personality. You don't know anything about their personality. How would you be able to know what their personality is like? But let's pretend for a second that we're gonna go beyond the superficial, that we're not gonna judge them based on their picture. And we're gonna look at who they are as a person, as an individual, because the truth is the picture is only gonna last so long. That's the reality. And you have to like the person for who they are if you're looking for a long-term relationship. And let's pretend that you're actually gonna to wanna to spend some time with them. You're gonna say that you wanna know who the person is and you did some research on them and you went on a first date, but you don't know who they are because that beginning, the first, that first processing of the relationship is a strange time. So I'm a very big fan is try again, try a second date. Everyone deserves two tries, everybody. I don't care how bad it is. 
Everyone deserves two tries. They could have been off that night. They could have been, and you don't know. And it's so funny because so many, well, you know, I didn't feel the spark. What does that mean? I didn't feel the spark. What are you looking for? I wish sometimes that I could just take fireworks, put it, go in the middle of a date, put it on the back of the chair right behind her, and all of a sudden, in the middle of a date, all the fireworks are going to go up. And I'm going to say, see, look, there's fireworks. I don't understand what people are looking for. What are they waiting for? What? There was no spark. What were you expecting? You know, you were expecting the animation where like all of a sudden there's like twinkles in the eyes and there's like these little twinkles that, 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 that pop up. Like, what are you expecting? Tell me. People say chemistry. Well, chemistry is for the lab. It's not for real life. I don't know what that means. Someone else says not unpleasant. I like that, not unpleasant, but but maybe that person just, it's an off night. Maybe you were off that night. You didn't even realize it. Sometimes I have two people that come back from a date and one of them will say to me, oh my gosh, that was amazing. And then I know the next call I'm gonna get from the other one, it's gonna be always oh, terrible, the worst night of my life. Cause that's the way it is. <laughs> that's just the way it is. One person thought it was amazing. The other one's gonna think it's terrible because you think that you're both having the same experience. Well, guess what? You're not having the same experience because you're two different people. I mean, how crazy is this idea of marriage and relationships? But I want to tell you one more thing, okay? When you go up on a date, when you go on a date, you are not going to the chuppah. When someone says, I'd like to set you up with someone, you don't have to marry them. It just means I am interested in this person. So if you're the kind of person who does research on the person beforehand, you just want enough research to say, hmm, I'm curious. I'm interested. I want to know more. That's all you want. That's it. You just want to know a little more. If that's enough, you go out with them. On the first date, you're not saying, is this person for me? Can I marry them? Stop skipping 30 steps. The question after the first date is, do I want to see this person again, period? Do I want a second date? That is your question after the first date. Do I want to see this person again? Not do I want to marry them? Not are we going to go to the chuppah? Stop romanticizing and dramatizing everything. Sorry, this is not my regular. I'm just being rough on you because you told me to be rough. After your first date, the question is, am I interested in learning more? Am I curious to know more about this person? If yes, let's do it again. And after the second date, the question is again, am I curious to know more? If yes, let's do a third date. Allow the process to happen. Allow the process to happen. Stop jumping. Oh, I know. You know the people who say, I can tell somebody in five minutes. Really? Did you go to school to get your degree for five minutes? Did you decide five minutes on your job? Things that are important in your life, you should not be deciding in five minutes. What does that mean? I know in five minutes. Tell me, what does that mean? I know in five minutes? I can know right away. Just, 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 just show me a picture, I know right away. No, next, 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 next. What are you looking for? Tell me, what are you looking for? How do you know? John Gottman, Dr. John Gottman, John and Julie Gottman, they are the, some of the foremost researchers on relationships today. They have the Love Lab in Seattle. They've written a number of best-selling books. They said that by the time you're 35, you will have dated four people you could have married. There are people that are in front of us and we have no idea they're the right person because we don't know what we're looking at because we don't know what we want. Someone says only four. Yeah, <laughs> good one. When you're, when you're looking to know what you want, you have to ask the following question. So many people can tell me, oh, long list. I ask them, what do you want? They know, I know, I, I don't want this. I do want this. I don't want this. And then when I ask them what I think is a much more difficult question. So the first question is the obvious question. So what are you looking for? Everyone asks that. So Oh, so, you know, your friend wants to set you up. So what are you looking for? What kind of person? 
And, and usually you can give a, an elevator pitch. This is the kind of person I want. This is what I'm attracted to. Hopefully you can say that, right? You know, you, you know that. Then there's another question that I think is even more important. And that is, who am I? What do I bring to the relationship? What do I have to sell? What do I have to give to the relationship? So I'll give you an example. And because this is something that I find that happens so often, because when you look at on paper at the person you're looking for and the person you are that you bring to the relationship, you have to ask a very important question. Can these two people be married? The person I am and the person I'm looking for, can they be married to each other? So I was talking to uh, a young woman this week and she had a broken engagement. And she, I asked her, can you distill what was the main reason why you broke the engagement? And she says, because he was controlling. I said, okay. She said, so I decided I really don't want a man who's controlling. He was really controlling. I don't want that. Okay, wonderful. That's fine. That's fair. I'm sure there were other things also, the reason why you broke an engagement, but controlling is a very good one. So, and then we started, so, so um, then she says, well, I want a man who's gonna take charge because I don't wanna take charge. So you don't wanna take charge. What you bring to the relationship is you don't wanna take charge, but you don't want someone who's controlling. You don't wanna take charge and you don't want someone who's controlling. These two people can't be married to each other. You follow me? There's a, there's, there's, there's a disconnect here. So if you're wondering, yes, I agree with you, it's pretty extreme. There is a normal middle, but I have to use extremes in order to generalize here. But I agree with you on that, it is extreme. And this is a real story, it really happened this week. But the reason why I think it's so important is in your own life, you have to just make sure that you are the complement of the person you're looking for. That you can be married to the person you're looking for, but more importantly, that you have what to give to be married to the person you're looking for. It's just something, I want you to think about this. I actually have a method to the madness. I can, I can send you a questionnaire that you can actually, that will help you decide this and, and, and kind of map this out for yourself. Now, what about that person who says, I know right away? I always know right away. First of all, I say to them, how's that worked out for you so far? And I know everyone hates when I say this, but I'm gonna say it again. And I know it's a stab in the heart. And, and everyone says, Rabbi, why did you say this again? Stop saying this. But I want you to, to hear what I'm saying. And I want you to, to really think about it. You are the common denominator in all of your failed relationships. You are it. Don't blame it on someone else. The other person was also there. Don't blame it on someone else. You are the common denominator in all of your failed relationships. Now, in order to be in a relationship, you need to, the, the dynamics of relationship down to its core is something that I'm gonna call, well, I don't call this, there's a psychologist, his name is Bowen, he calls it differentiation. You have to be able to show a vulnerable side of yourself. You have to be able to, to be fun. You have to be able to, be, to, to, be, to, to give to the relationship, which means if you go on a date and you're, everything is perfect, everything is just, just hunky-dory, everything is just so, you're, you're making a huge mistake because how do you keep that impression up? There's so many dates that start with the wrong premise, with the premise that everything has to be perfect. No, I would rather the date start with authenticity. Nothing should be perfect. Mess up on purpose, spill that water. You know why? Because life happens. Spill it and laugh about it. You don't want to start with everything is perfect. So many people, create this perfect image of themselves, and then they don't realize why they, why they don't feel anything. Well, they don't feel anything. The date's not going anywhere. The relationship's not going anywhere because it started off on the premise that it's fake. Your relationship needs to start off real. 
the end. If I only said that tonight, that should be enough for you. The process of relationship is this process called differentiation. So uh, my good friend, Dr. Asal Romanelli, who I often share this platform with, many of you know him from our therapists and the rabbi sessions. If you haven't heard any of them, a lot of them are available and you can listen to them or watch them. He talks about differentiation and that's how I learned it. And he's, what differentiation is, the ability to maintain your sense of self when you are emotionally and or physically close to someone else. So especially as that person becomes increasingly important to you, you need to be autonomous and connected. It's the increased balance between the need for attachment and the need for autonomy. That is the nature of relationships, differentiation, to be close and autonomous, to be connected and autonomous. You don't wanna just stay two separate people and you don't wanna be enmeshed. You want to be both your own person and autonomous at the same time. That is the process of differentiation. Now, how does that happen? If you're gonna start the relationship on a false premise, you're not gonna go anywhere. How do you create that differentiation? How do you become vulnerable in the relationship if you're starting off with a false pretense? That's not gonna help you. We live in this fast paced, instant world. It's not worth it. It's not worth it to live in this instant world, to use all of the, the mechanisms of the world in, in long-term relationships. Most people are basing their relationships on the movies. You know how long a movie is? It's two hours. So if you wanna have a two hour relationship, then you should get relationship advice from movies. It's amazing. You have a beginning, you have a middle and an end in two hours. It's brilliant. If you want that kind of relationship, take your relationship advice from the movies. So many things used to be innate. We used to know that. Somebody says here, movies always have happy endings. That's true. So is that what relationships is about? You always want the happy ending? Don't you want it to be real? Don't you want to be a better person, a better version of yourself than you could be alone. We believe as Jews, we have a value. And our value is that the most important thing that you should be doing in your adult life is getting married. Society has a very different value. We are educated in a society that the value is maybe the most important thing is your career. You can't have two career and relationship as the two most important things in your life. Only one of them can be the most important. So it's one is gonna have to give. If you choose your career as the most important, your relationship's gonna give. And if you choose your relationship as the most important, then your career is gonna give. And you have to decide that. It's a hard decision to make. And so many people choose their career and then they get to an age, okay, I'm, I'm settled, I've got my career figured out. I'm financially stable, and now I'm gonna get a relationship figured out. And then what do I do? And then they start, and one of the questions I got earlier about older singles, that happens to a lot of older singles because they made a choice. And you gotta live with the choices that you make. Is it right? Is it wrong? I didn't decide that choice. You decided that choice. You told me I could be rough on you, so I'm doing it. If you want a two hour relationship, get it from the movies. Next. You ignore his or her faults and you're in denial of them. You see the faults, but you ignore them. Why? Because so often we're not honest with ourselves. You don't wanna see the faults because you don't wanna end something that's good. Who wants to end a good thing? Look, you know, so many couples, they don't wanna talk about that thing when they're dating because they know look, who wants to end a good thing. How many people? end up in a relationship that they don't want because they just didn't want to end it? How many people 
don't get into a serious conversation because they were afraid that maybe the other person will want to end it. Is this differentiation? Is this the ability to be close while being autonomous? Is this really a relationship? What's right or wrong? What's going on? Things that will go beyond the surface because they don't want to end something that's good. Really? Then there's, then there's number three. You admit to his or her faults, but the infatuation is so strong that you brush them aside. It's like a patient after major surgery. The patient is put on morphine and he knows that there's pain, but they can't feel it. They can't access it. So the patient doesn't deal with it. So when you're infatuated, you know that the flaw is there. So hooked on the infatuation that nothing seems to matter. In effect, you still view the object of your infatuation as perfect because it's much easier to look at it that way. And I'm not saying that it's not a good thing. Optimism is definitely better than pessimism when it comes to relationships. I would rather be in a relationship with an optimist and a pessimist any day, but you also want to be a realist. And realism doesn't mean pessimism. It just means knowing what you're dealing with, knowing the true and the false, knowing the good, knowing the bad, knowing what's important to know. Now, I think it's especially problematic because people who are doing this actually think that they're being realistic. They admit the flaw, but they don't realize that they're really on morphine. Actually, I think that the analogy of morphine is not so far from the truth because studies have shown that when a person is experiencing infatuation, there's a substance called PEA that's released into their system. And the PEA has a potential to bring feelings of bliss, to bring feelings of euphoria. And this substance, this PEA that's released in the brain is a natural amphetamine. And I think that explains why people need so little sleep when they're infatuated. So maybe, I'm just saying this, possibly that the person who's infatuated is really intoxicated. The person is really feeling a rush that happens during that infatuation process with all the hormones, with, with all the excitement. That rush allows the person to be in this blissful state. And that's exciting for the moment, but it only lasts for the moment, as long as you're infatuated. And then it wears off and then reality hits, boom, what's next? What's next? A while ago, I, I met someone who had a tendency of being verbally abusive. And she, was, she wasn't mean all of the time, but sometimes she would slip. And it happened to be that she did so once in front of me. I happened to see this. And I told her that, that I, I had seen this. And she was in a relationship at the time. And apparently he, she was very verbally abusive and he saw it also, but he couldn't see it. He said, no, nah, it's not a big issue. This guy was too infatuated to realize how toxic her behavior was. They got married. And after they got married, she continued that abusive behavior and eventually they got divorced. Now I know again, this is an extreme example. I have to generalize here by using extreme examples, but the truth is, I think had he sobered up earlier, the mistake could have been avoided. So I think someone who's infatuated could ask the following question. Isn't love all about accepting and loving a person with all their flaws or in spite of their flaws? Isn't that what I'm doing? I'm loving the person, flaws and all. Isn't that what it's all about? And I think you're right if you're asking this. It's a tricky question. And in order to find the answer, we have to remember the following. And here's a, here's a key component. Infatuation is effortless. 
while love requires effort. I'm just going to put this in the, in the chat box over here. Infatuation is effortless. I'm just writing it out over here. While love requires effort. The difference between how infatuation deals with flaws versus how love deals with flaws is like this. Infatuation effortlessly ignores or plays down someone's flaws. Love consciously accepts those faults, but it chooses to focus on the positive with effort. So instead of playing down the flaws, you know the flaws, you accept the flaws, and you focus on the positive. And I think there's a very big difference. So, so let's talk about flaws for a second. While infatuation effortlessly ignores or, or plays down the flaws, and love consciously accepts those flaws, and to, by choosing to, to focus on the positive. So what happens when you're in a truly loving relationship? How is a truly loving relationship different from an infatuated relationship? And I think there could be a very, very fine line between the two. In a loving relationship, for example, in a serious marriage, what happens is, and obviously I have to generalize again, that two people meet and they like each other, and they share goals, and they share values, and there's attraction, and they spend time together, and they get to know each other, and they, they really talk, and they go beyond the image, so to speak. Then their relationship gets more serious. Maybe their faults become more apparent. They don't ignore, they don't deny the faults. Rather, they responsibly consider whether they can handle those particular faults because they're coming up. They're able to assess the authenticity of this relationship. And as they progress, they build the foundation of the marriage on values, on respect, on honesty, on knowledge, on attraction, rather than wishful thinking. Blind attraction, a false sense of security. The relationship is built on a genuine acceptance of their spouse's imperfections, rather than a denial of them. Now I just wanna talk one last thing before we go on to our next part about love. I've always questioned what love is. What is love really? Does love really exist? Is love an integral part of a relationship? I know that the movies taught us and I know that we've read romance novels and they've taught us that. And, and I know that the main idea out there in the world is that no one would get married if not for love. And of course, it's all about love. But, but what is love? And, and the version of love that you're thinking about right now, is that version of love an integral part of the relationship? I want to ask that question. And in order, and I, I see, I, I could see that everyone's kind of uh, feeling a little uh, antsy over here. So what I'm going to do in order to answer that question, before I answer that, I'd like to do something. And you don't have to do it. I would like if you did it. I, um, I'm going to put you all into breakout rooms. I'd like you to get to know each other, um, which means you're going to have to put on your video. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to randomly choose the breakout rooms. I don't know what's going to happen. We're going to get we're going to let God decide what happens here. Um, I guess you don't have to press the button to go in. No one's forcing you to do anything. But if you do, who knows what will happen? It could be something very special here tonight. I would love for you to put on your video when you're in the breakout room. Some of you may not have video. And we're going to try this um, for about seven minutes. We're going to do a seven-minute breakout room, just a small one. And the question is, what is love? And I'm going to, I'm going to do the button right now. See. So I love to hear, looks like I see some smiling faces coming back from the breakout rooms, which means I guess there was some success. People uh, are happy with the experience. Um, I love to hear what, what, what uh, you put in the, in the chat. What did you come up with? What is love? I hear feeling comfortable, being able to communicate openly and honestly. Same values, able to laugh and have fun. I love that. What else? What else did you learn in your breakout rooms? Trust, connection. Oh, fantastic. I see all these really smiley faces coming back in here from the breakout rooms. Fantastic. Okay. 
So what did you learn about love? I want to hear it. I want to see it in the chat. What did you learn about love? Love, someone says, is the condition where the happiness of another person is essential to your own. Wow. Treat their happiness like your happiness. Connection. Wow. Amazing. Feeling comfortable. Being able to communicate openly and honestly. And honestly. How amazing is that? What else? <laughs> yep. One breakout room got my parents. It's true. That must have been fun. My parents are here on the, on the, in the group. So that must have been fun for you. Communicate and have balance. Amazing. How great is this? So I think it seems like A, we were able to create connection, which is great. Love is firstly about connection of some sort. And there's all types of love. Love, as you said, communication, trying to find balance. So it seems to me like many of you have a very good version of love, that you actually see love properly, that you're not looking at love the way that love is, is in, the, in the movies. I mean, if you think about the movies or the TV show, it looks like love because some writer constructed that love experience, but it's not real. If you have that same experience and you're like, oh my gosh, it's exactly the same thing that I'm experiencing. The character that's in that show is exactly what I'm talking about. It's unbelievable, but it doesn't pan out the same way it pans out for him or her. And so you're like, you get into trouble by thinking that the rest of the narrative, that the rest of the movie is gonna be exactly the way that you expected the movie to be because that's how you saw it. I don't understand. Like the person said earlier, it was supposed to be happily ever after, but it didn't happen. It didn't happen. So there's a couple that I know that have been married for a few years. And already during the dating, there was a big issue. He was often late. He came to the dates late. He came to pick her up late. He wasn't, if you've ever been into my class about the big five, he wasn't the conscientious type. And now this girl, she knew it. She knew, and it bothered her because she was very conscientious and she wanted things to be just so. She wanted things to be on time, but he wasn't the conscientious type. And she had a decision to make. She could marry him. And there were a lot of things that were very right about him. There were a lot of things that were very right about the relationship. So she decided that she could handle it. She knew what she was getting herself into. She knew that the guy was always late. She knew exactly what was going on. And she decided that I can deal with this and it's okay. And now they're happily married. And anyone happily married, including this couple knows this, that imperfections that you know about a particular person, they could become annoying at times. But if you have a strong foundation in your relationship, a relationship that's based on reality, a relationship that does not start, and I can't say this enough, that doesn't start with fake. It's authentic, it's real. You're not being fake. You started off a relationship that you can carry. If you started off fake, if it's all the way up here, where are you gonna go from there? If it's already perfect in the first date, where is there to go for the next 50 years? And over time, what happens is you see them. The imperfections still exist but they're not as important because you're starting slowly over time to see that there's a bigger picture. And he began to change. He began to improve. And as a result of the marriage, I know that a lot of you can see that maybe, you know, he was a fixer upper and some women like that, the fixer upper, or maybe she had an effect on him that maybe that's true, but she was able to slowly change him. And, and I think, that, that's really special. I think it's really special. I think that a lot of people, they, they want to get into the relationship. They want to move forward, but they don't know what the next move is. They, know, they don't know how to do it. Our society did not set us up for long-term relationships. We're set up for instant relationships, 
for two hour relationships, for movie relationships. That is how our society set us up. So it's not a shocker that we don't know what to do next. And so often relationships kind of just kind of falter. They just wither away because we didn't know how to push it forward. Relationships need to start off real. They need to start off authentic. Don't try to be perfect. Don't try to portray a version of yourself that you're not. The more real you are in the beginning, the more space and room you have. I've been, I've been thinking about this for a while. And I think that we have two types of soulmates. I don't like the word basherit because that is implying, and someone asked me this before and I'm gonna answer this. That's implying that there's one person out there and then every single person you see, you're like, oh my gosh, that could be the one. My gosh, maybe they're the one. Oh my gosh, look at that nose. They have a nose, they have eyes, they have a mouth. That person could be the one. Too much pressure. You're putting too much pressure on something that doesn't need that much pressure. But I think you have two types of soulmates, two types of people that you can end up marrying. You can end up marrying a pleaser. Whatever you want, dear, whatever you want. Or you can marry what the Torah calls an Ezer Kinegdo, a helpmate against you, someone whose job is to make you a better person. And there's a lot of people who go for the person who's not going to make them a better person, who's just going to say yes, yes, yes to everything. The ideal soulmate is somebody who's going to push you to be a better person, who's going to care about you enough to allow you to grow and become better. That's the ideal soulmate. The non-ideal soulmate is someone who's just gonna yes dear you the whole time. Yes dear, sure, whatever you want. I mean, if you can handle that for 50 years, it will get annoying. I mean, maybe it's great because you're like, wow, I want that. I want someone who's just gonna say yes to everything. Well, maybe. Somebody asked me, what if I can't find that person? I find so often that people are either, either too much in their heart or too much in their head. You, you told me I can, be, I can be tough on you tonight. I'm being tough. You're either too much in your heart, too much in your head. There needs to be a balance. What you're attracted to needs to be the same as what you know you want. Your heart needs to feel attracted to the person you know you want. So often we're attracted to someone that we don't know that we want. We know that it's the wrong person. We know they're not gonna be good for us. If we really trusted ourselves, we know they're not good, but somehow we're attracted because they're attractive. If you're looking for the long term type of relationship, the real type of relationship, You're looking for someone who can be your Ezer Kinegdo, your helpmate against you, someone who can help you grow, someone who can push you, someone who can make you a better person. That's what you want. That's not the non-ideal. That is the ideal type of person. I know it sounds crazy. Why would I want that? Well, just ask people who are married. They'll tell you why you want that. Because without that, you're not the ideal person that you should be. I have so many other things that I want to talk about tonight, but I think I'm going to, I'm going to end my spiel here and I'm going to go into um, taking your questions. I know a lot of you were asking questions throughout. I'm going to go and start answering um, some of those questions that you were asking. And you're welcome to start filling the chat with your other questions and I will try to get to all of them. Okay, I'm going all the way back up the chat and making sure I don't miss any questions. I'll also let you take a breather. Hineni, are you with me? How are you feeling? How's it going? Very soon I'm gonna let, I'll also let you unmute as, the, as we progress. We're gonna try to do this for a little bit. Let's see how long this, this lasts and how interested you are, okay. Am I normal if I don't get married? I think that as the years go on, I'm assuming the person who asked this was an older single. So I'm gonna to speak to the older singles right now. As the years go on, it gets harder and harder 
to find someone because we get very set in our ways. And we have a lot more shtick and a lot more baggage and a lot more stuff. And it's very hard to find a place physically, mentally, and emotionally for someone else. If you feel like you're okay without getting married, I wouldn't get married. You have to feel like you need that person. Like your life is not complete. Like you're, you're missing a part of your life. That's why you get married. Because you know, is there connected? There's somebody out there and you're missing a part of your life without that person. So I agree with that person. If you don't want to get married, I mean, there's a lot of shtick, there's a lot of stuff. Sometimes, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. Sometimes you have to clear out half of your closet and you have to, you have to you know, sleep on one side of your bed and you have to sit at one chair at your table. You have to really feel like there's something missing physically in your life. And you're looking for someone to fill that. If you have no space, first, if you have no space physically, if you have no space emotionally, if you have no space spiritually or mentally, there's no space for someone, you're not going to find that person, period. You need to make space. You've got to empty it out, dump, purge. Don't only purge physically, purge emotionally. If you're holding on to the past, purge it. You need to dump that stuff in order to let someone else into your life. What's considered too fast or too slow? Look, that's why I think, you know, when you're dating, I, I really believe it's so important to have a third party, to have that matchmaker type person who can push the date along, to, create, to, to push that process along, and then to have that coach or that mentor or somebody who can really be your sounding board, who you really will listen to and you'll trust that their advice. I'm very much the go with the flow type and I see the good in others. How do I know if he's truly for me or not? I think that you need a good person to, to, to be your buffer. I think you need a good friend and a good coach. I can't say enough the power of having really good advice and having a really good person to talk to who you trust, who can, can give you sound advice. It's so important. This person asks, when is it time to move on. It's time to move on when your coach or your mentor tells you to move on. Until then, it's not time to move on. There's too many emotions going on when you're dating. How are you to ever know what's good, what's bad, what's ugly? How are you to ever know that? How do you know when to trust someone? Oh, what a great question, person who asked that question. How do you know when to trust someone? You know when to trust someone after seven years of marriage. According to Gottman, it takes seven years to develop trust. Now, there are different points. And at some point, we'll have a class and we'll talk about trust. And we'll just talk about trust, the process of trust. There are things that you can know. There are signs that you can know today. But if you're looking for it to be sure, you're never sure. There's always going to be an element of faith. There's always going to be an element of the unknown. That's just the reality of relationships. You have two separate people from two separate places. There's going to be an element of the unknown, and there's nothing you can do about that. What to expect with regards to blending children from a second marriage? That's a really great question. I am going to, um, uh, rare, rarely do I do this, but I'm going to hold that question for a different time, and I will do an evening for older singles or for people um, that uh, are. Uh, looking at second marriages and talking about divorce and talking about second marriages and what to learn from that and how to create the blended family. I will, that's a whole separate topic and I would love to, to really give it the time that it needs. Okay, going through these questions. You're welcome to continue sending me your questions. How do we deal with people's preferences for in-person dating? Oh, I already answered that one. Um, someone asks, where do we find these people? If you look, you find. If it's the main thing that you do, if you truly believe, as the Torah believes, that this is the most important thing that you should be doing with your adult life, you're going to find the right person. You also have to know what you're looking for. Then you're going to find them. I don't, it's very hard for me in all of my years, 
And I know there are some exceptions. You may be the exception, but it's very hard for me to believe that if you look, you're not going to find it. If you seek, you're not going to find it. If it's the most important thing, if you're going to look at it like you look for a job, if you're going to look like you like you look for anything that's really important in your life, if you're truly going to look, you're going to find. Okay, how long do you suggest dating virtually that there won't be Zoom fatigue? I asked, I answered that already, but I'll just answer it again now. Um, I think that you have to be very careful with um, how you date on Zoom and you have to make sure that the dating is not just like an interview. Hello, how are you? No, it has to be, you play games together, you have shared experiences. You could, you could transcend the screen in your dating process. And if you need to know about that, maybe I'll do a session just on Zoom dating. Maybe that'll be good. If you want that, look, I all the, all the ideas for these sessions, I get from people who send me these ideas. If you have ideas for future sessions, if you think, if there's enough people who think it's a good idea for me to talk about such and such and such, I will do these. This is for you. I mean, I'm not doing it for myself, that's for sure. Um, especially if somebody is in another country and travel is more challenging, Zoom dating is very, very important. COVID forced Zoom dating, and it's wonderful for out-of-town dates. I agree, and I think it's something that should continue even after COVID, because I think it's, it's a practical thing. We just, they have to be able to transcend the screen. You have to be able to, to and, and you could, look, there's a certain intimacy even here that we have with people who have their screen on. And if it's just two of us, I'm sure there'll be a shared intimacy there. It's a very long question here. Let me see if I, I didn't read this in the, before, but let me see, I'll, I'll read it here. Is it possible to meet your Bashert, but the timing is all wrong? Okay, it's a whole particular question. Um, we believe timing is very important. Yes, you could you could meet your Bashert and the timing is all wrong. There's a couple that I set up, one of the first matches I ever made. And I set this couple up and they were they said no. And then I set them up a year later and they said no. And I set them up a year later. It took six times of setting them up until they got married. Okay, fine. I'm a little crazy like that, and I was sure of it. But but I believe that the reason why that happened is because the timing was wrong. The one thing I would say is that if somebody takes the time to set you up, honor it. Nobody said you have to go to the chuppah. All it is is I'm interested. I would be interested in anyone that someone set me up with. All you have to say is, I'm interested, that's it. And then after the first date, I'm still interested. I'm not interested in the chuppah. Stop skipping to level 20 when you're only at level zero. It's just, I'm interested. And as long as I'm interested, you continue it. And you go interest, a little more interest, a little more interest, a little more interest, and you allow that process to happen. I don't know why we keep on skipping the process. The process needs to happen. What questions to ask to know if the person wants marriage is the end point without coming on strong and too aggressive? Are you looking for a serious relationship? Why is it a game? Why are we so scared of saying the thing? Just say the thing, just say it. I'm looking for a serious relationship, are you? You think you're gonna scare them away? You're scaring everybody away? Maybe you're gonna knock some sense into them, I don't know. Just say it. Why does everyone think they're coming on so strong? You're not coming on, you just, you're, you're being honest and open. I think that you've got to start from a place of honesty. You've got to start this relationship from a place of authenticity. Um, someone says to me, easier said than done. Okay, fair, but done is possible. You can say easier said than done, but done is still possible. Okay, here's an interesting one. When meeting, I'm always clear about my no touching rules. My dates always agree and they say that they are on the same belief. And then three weeks later, they're asking to hold hands or wanting hugs. It's irritating and the per person switches their beliefs and stops respecting the boundaries. Great question. You know what I have to say? Two things. Number one, if that, if that, I'm assuming that, well, I know it's a female that's asking this. If the guy wants to hold your hand, it means that he's, he's interested in you and he wants the next step. So you know what you should do? 
should allow him the next step, which is you should you should say, okay, this relationship is getting serious. Maybe it's time for engagement. And someone's saying, oh my gosh, you just wanted to hold your hands and you, you want to get engaged already? Come on, that's insane. Well, if you give him what he wants without marriage, then what do you expect? There needs to be, and I've said this before, but I'll say it again. In a long-term relationship, one of the most important things is curiosity. There should always be a level of curiosity. And the way the Torah set it up, it's not because we're trying to play games here. We're trying to make it difficult for you. And we're trying, we want, you want to create that connection, that spark. He wants to hold your hand. It means that there's a chemistry there. Talk about the chemistry out of the lab. So let that chemistry build up. Let that tension build up, but allow the process to happen. Why are we so scared of going to the next level? Why, after three weeks, it would make sense. If you are not touching, you should not be dating for more than a month, maybe two months, because that's hard. There's a lot of emotions there. That's crazy for you. So that makes sense that after three weeks, he wants to hold your hands. It means he's ready. Okay, so say, um, maybe we're ready for the next step. And if he doesn't want to propose, maybe you could propose. Why not? It's world of equality, isn't it? Equal. What happened to our world, right? Everything's equal. So if everything's equal, let it be equal. Get down on your knee and show him a watch. The men rush me, this person says. I want to get to know them, but they want to get engaged so quickly. Hmm, the exact opposite. I don't know. There's a lot of stuff I could unpack that question, but I would have to um, know a lot more. So I'm going to skip that question. And if you want to send me that question again with more details, I'm happy to answer it. He said my picture didn't look like me in real life and then dumped me. So sad for him. If he's dumping you because your picture didn't look like you in real life, you don't want him. Stop being fake. Be real. How many times can I say it? I'm only being so rough because you told me I could be. I'm just saying this over and over again. You're like, what is this guy? It's, it's like, it sounds like he's got a chip on his shoulder tonight. Um, what do you do if one party just is not attracted to the other? There's a lot of people because of our society that are not attracted. They're not attracted because they're attracted to the vision of the person they have in their head. I see this so often. Last night, this person was messaging me a whole list of everything they want. And so what I did was I took that entire list. This is, this is what I did last night. I've been talking about doing it for a while, but I actually did it. I took that whole list and I just put it into Google and I pressed images and an image of a woman came up and I took the image of the woman and I said, you want this person? It was like some celebrity, I think. And he says, yes, yes. I said, good. I want you to print out the picture, put it on a cardboard. So you have a nice cutout of this picture, blow it up. So it's in, you know, life size and I will marry you to your picture because you're not looking for a real person. You're looking for an image of the person in your head. So why don't you get the image out of your head and start looking for a real person? Very often, if you're not attracted, probably it means that you don't know what, it, what, what you're attracted to. You don't know what you're looking for. Like Gottman says, he says that by the time you're 35, you would have dated someone four people that you could have married. By the time you're 35, you have dated four people you could have married. You didn't know what you were looking for. And that's okay. Just say the thing. Just say, I don't know what I'm looking for. I got to figure out what I'm looking for. And that's been my problem all these years. Because I can't figure out what I'm looking for. Say it. Finally, admit it to yourself. Stop lying. Men skip this process and they jump to marriage. Why? Some men don't want to date. You know what I always say? The worst daters are the best husbands. 
because everything that you need to know in order to be a good dater is exactly the opposite of everything you need to know to be a good husband. So if he's a bad dater, probably a good husband. Just remember that. Um, didn't you say you always give someone a second chance? I always say give someone a second chance. Two dates, never one, always twice, everything in pairs. And if you have three, you should have four. Always pairs, okay? Because there's a process to this. So if you did one, do two. If you did three, do four. If after the fourth, you say, no, that's fair. If after the eighth, you say, no, that's fair, but not after the seventh. Everything in pairs. If he behaves inappropriately after the first date and he asks you um, inappropriate questions, I won't get into the details. The person says a couple of inappropriate questions and he tries to, you know what? Does he still get a second chance? No. If that's not what you're looking for, then no. Unless you can say, just say to him, I'm not looking for this. Do you want a relationship that progresses and doesn't go to step 10 before I go through step one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine? As long as you're real and you're authentic, then you have nothing to lose. Just say the thing. If that is your non-negotiable, if that is your value, then say it. Okay. Does compliment necessarily mean opposites? Um, no, compliment does not mean opposites. I've spoken about this quite a number of times before. Compliment means the other half of you, not the opposite of you, but the part of you that's missing. So um, I'm not gonna talk about it tonight, but I did speak about the big five uh, a number of sessions ago, and I would encourage you to, um, to look at my session on the big five, where I talk about the complementary values. Like for example, introvert and extrovert, and there's four others. That is what I mean by compliment. Uh, if he doesn't laugh and he critiques you and tells you, does that tell you a lot about his character? I don't know, depends on what, on the first date, no, he's gonna be very nervous. Um, on the fifth date, yeah, probably, but you, you can't judge anybody from a first date. People are really nervous. And like I said before, there's really no way to unawkwardize a first date. Um, staying separate individuals, what does that mean? It's a very good question. Um, I did a session just on differentiation with Dr. Romanelli. I would encourage you to take a look at that. I can't explain it in 30 seconds or less. But it really what you're wanting to understand is have a deeper understanding of what differentiation is. Remember the basic definition of differentiation is your ability to be in a relationship while being autonomous and staying separate. There's ability to be in a relationship and be autonomous at the same time and not to become enmeshed. But that we need more than 30 seconds, like I said. How do you stop judging someone else? Wow, it's a deep question. I don't know where that's coming from. Um, definitely when you're dating, it's really not a good thing to start off your dating uh, with judgment. I mean, I think you can put up a little bit of a barrier, a little bit of a defensive mechanism, but be careful because you don't want to put up such a barrier that you're blocking the person. You don't want to block the person. What is a question to ask to know if the person wants marriage as the end point without coming strong into aggressive? Oh, the person asked me that question again, I guess. Um, okay, I answered that already. We need a career to sustain marriage, to support ourselves and our families we build. I agree, but you have to decide which one is more important and which one is first. Does career come first, family come first? At the end of the day, I'm a rabbi. As a rabbi, I'm gonna talk about Judaism, about Jews. We have something called faith. And we believe that if you do the right thing, the right thing will happen. We truly. And if you believe that there's a God in the world and you have faith and that God said the most important thing that you should be doing in your adult life is getting married, then everything else will come. And we really believe that. And if you don't believe that, well, let me tell you, there are so many unknowns in relationships and there are so many unknowns in careers. People who have amazing careers who can't get a job. 
They did everything right. They can't get a job. At the end of the day, there's faith. There's a God. God runs the world. And just remember that. And we believe that the most important thing you should be doing in your adult life is building a family, getting married, period. So what would be the end result if you accept the flaws versus playing them down, ignoring them? How would that look different? It's a very good question. So before I was talking about um, accepting their flaws versus playing them down. So accepting the flaws means that you build on the strengths. You build on the person. So, so often it's very easy, especially as you get to know someone in a relationship to see their flaws. It just happens. If you're in a real relationship, you're going to start seeing their flaws. And so how do you not ignore them? Well, you have to focus on the positive. Don't focus on the negative. It's so important. And there's a very big difference. When you're looking, when you're looking to judge, when you're looking to pinpoint, you're going to see it. I'm not saying ignore it, but don't focus on it. Okay, let's go to, someone says, what if you can't find that soulmate, the one who's the Ezer Konegdo? I wanna be patient and kind. I wanna meet the right person. Why is God not sending him? You know what I say to you? I say, God will send him when you know. You gotta make sure you have to make sure that you make a vessel in order for God to send him. What does the vessel look like? There's a spiritual vessel. There's a physical vessel. If you want to have water, if you want to have water, you can hold water and you can put your mouth over the sink and try to get some water, or you can cup it in your hands, or you can hold a cup. But depending on what kind of vessel you have is how much water you can hold in it. The blessing of finding your soulmate is so powerful, it's so huge, you need a big cup. You need a big vessel. And since it's your Dawid Kislev, and we celebrate the anniversary of the Rebbe and the Rebbe, and the Rebbe used to speak very often about various vessels that people can create in order to get the blessing of marriage. One is, uh, is and there's many of them. I, I, I can give you, my mother made a list of them I, uh, that I have that I can share with you. Um, but uh, one of them is, is giving charity, but specifically giving charity more than you can afford. Giving it to a needy bride. Um, also giving it in denominations of 18. Giving it on a daily basis, he says, in denominations of 18, very important. Um, taking on a, a mitzvah, taking on a big mitzvah. You know, mitzvahs are connectors. It comes from the word safta, which means connection. You take on a mitzvah that maybe you wouldn't do, but it's, it's hard for you, a mitzvah that, that is difficult for you. And you say, I take this on, dear God, with the desire and with the goal that I want to find my other half. And there's many, many other types of vessels. But most of those spiritual vessels have to do with, the type, with mitzvahs, mitzvahs that are, that are, that are difficult. If they were easy, then you'd be making a little, a little vessel. You need a big vessel. There's also another thing, and it comes into Kabbalah and Hasidus as well, is you have to empty out the garbage also. You got to empty out. Sometimes our vessels are too full and we got to empty out our vessels, meaning that you got to make space for the new. Sometimes it's full of too much junk and we got to let go. We have to stop holding grudges. We have to stop living in the past. That's also very important. Um, okay, my past relationships. He stopped being my Ezer Konegdo and refused to allow me to be his Ezer Konegdo. That's why we broke up. So how do we trust again? You know, you're talking about, a, a, you obviously were married and um, it happens. Some couples grow together and some couples grow apart. It's not, a, just because you got married doesn't mean that you can stay married. You have to continuously, and I say this to a lot of couples that I marry, that you have to continuously work on your marriage. Mar relationships don't just happen. They are worked on. They develop through work. 
and they don't just happen. So yeah, you 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 uh, grew apart instead of together. It happens. I'm sorry for you. How do we hold on the weight if we've been waiting for a long time? Stop waiting and do something about it. Don't wait for it to come. Do something. Make a vessel. Do something. If you're doing the same thing over and over again for all these years, figure out there's something wrong. Get yourself a mentor, a coach, somebody who can give you good advice. Stop making it a survey. There's a reason why you've been waiting all this time and you've been trying the same things and not getting it. Do you really want to get married? Ask yourself. You said I could be tough on you tonight. Ask yourself, do I really want to get married? Do I have space in my life for someone? Am I willing to make a vessel? Am I willing to, 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 to make that happen? Am I willing to do e everything, anything to make it happen? Or am I just stubborn? I don't know. He's got to come to New York. He's got to, he's got, it's got to be, you know, it's not a good night for me. I don't know. I don't really have a time. What priority is it? This is a priority. How long, if you have a degree, how long did you spend in university? Every single day, the exams, the things. This is what it is. It's, I, to me, it's the equivalent of the degree. Sometimes people are lucky. They're lucky. They can get their, their marriage degree in, uh, in, in, in you know, a few months. But sometimes it takes four years, six years. If you're a doctor, it takes even longer. You got to work towards it. You got to spend time. You got to toil it. You got to make the, the proper, you have to prepare yourself. What's blocking you? You got to figure all that out. You can't figure it out yourself. Your nose is in the way. How are you going to be able to see yourself if your nose is in the way? You got to make sure that you can, you can find someone who can give you advice, who can help you face your shadow. You say that it's important to be vulnerable and spill the beans in the first part of a date. But most people tell you that you shouldn't share all of your emotional baggage with someone you just met five minutes ago. The fear of scaring them off. How much do you share and how much you're being imperfect, real, and authentic and vulnerable? I didn't say turn it into a therapy session. What do you mean? Being honest doesn't mean you should share your whole life story. I'm just saying be real. Just be yourself. Don't be fake. Don't be stiff. Be yourself. Be who you are. Don't be scared. Don't be afraid. I didn't say turn it. Don't make your date a therapy session. You don't have to tell, and you shouldn't be telling your date all of your emotional garbage. That's for your therapist. That's for your mentor. That's for your coach. That's for someone else. That's for the person giving you advice, not for your date. You know, it could be that your date may never know some of that. And that's okay. You know, I, it, I hear it so often from women, as I'm generalizing, but I hear it from women more than I hear it from men. So I'll say, women come to me and say, my gosh, I mean, the guy thought I was free therapy. Stop it. She's not free therapy. You don't have to tell her all your emotional garbage. Okay? Just because you bought her dinner doesn't mean she's free therapy. Can't even buy dinner anymore. Look at that. You got a Zoom date. He didn't pay anything for the free therapy. No wonder why he likes it. Being real doesn't mean you, 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 you spill all the, all, all, your whole life out. Being real means just being real, being in touch with yourself, not starting from a place that's fake, starting from a place that's real. Does it work if you're not as religious as the other? It's a very big question. Um, it's, it's a too vague question for me to answer it. There's ways that it does work and there's ways that it doesn't work. It really depends on the situation and it needs to be addressed. I have seen it work. I have been involved in a number of relationships where one was more religious than the other. It's okay. Um, what, what's, what's important is usually if they're on the same path, if they're going different directions, which means someone's leaving religion and the other one is growing, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't recommend that. But if they're both growing and they're just in different levels growing, I'm not as worried about that, but I'm generalizing here. Really, a question like that needs to be addressed by a mentor, by a coach, by a specific person. Zoom dating sessions would be wonderful. I was thinking about it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it. I, I've never been a big fan of speed dating. I don't like it, but I, I'm looking into a process now, which I'm going to call, I'm calling soul meat, like soul mates, but soul meat. 
And um, we're looking at, it's based on a certain um, psychology and a process to it. I'm working on it with actually Dr. Romanelli. So we'll be announcing that um, coming up. It's one of our big pro things that we're working on. We're working on a number of different things that are, that are gonna, hopefully we're gonna be launching soon. Um, I like to laugh. I like men, men who are patient. I like men who are intelligent. I don't like stingy. I'm not meeting this. Should I settle? Okay, let's try this again. I like to laugh. I'm happy you like to laugh. So laugh. You can just laugh. Look in the mirror and laugh. I like men who are patient. Wonderful. I'm proud of that. Probably your father's patient. Nice. I like men who are intelligent. Wonderful. Maybe your brother's intelligent. I don't like stingy. Wonderful. Does that mean that you need all that in a husband? I'm just asking you, are they all non-negotiables for you? So when you say, should I settle? It means every single one of these is a non-negotiable. That's a lot to ask from a theoretical person. You gotta decide what your real non-negotiable is and what your bonuses are. That's a lot to ask from a theoretical person. The more you build up your, th your theoretical list, the more you're gonna get let down. You're just setting yourself up for failure. I've, I've gone back and forth over the years as to how many things can be on your theoretical list. And I'm not sure. I have a process and we've spoken about this in the past. And I definitely think that you should, I'm gonna send you the questionnaire if you've never done it. You should definitely make your list. You should definitely work on that questionnaire. You should definitely do the process, but just be careful because the more things you have theoretically, the less things you allow for practically. You just get more and more married to your idea. And then you're saying, should I settle down? I hate that. What do you mean settle down? Who told you to settle down? That's terrible. It's not settling. It's just what you want to do is make sure it's really a non-negotiable. Don't hold non-negotiables that aren't really non-negotiables. Regarding accepting all dates someone sets you up with, what if you already know that it's not for me? How do you know that it's already not for you? How do you decide that? What, 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 what did you, what told you that it's not for you? Maybe it is for you. Who said it's not for you? Why do you decide that it's not for you? No, it's not for me. Why? I don't know. Other, I hear that. Reason, other. What does that mean? I don't like the personality. You don't know anything about them. Oh, I saw them on a speed dating for two minutes. Oh, I saw them at an event on the other side of the room. So they're not for me. What does that mean? What, you didn't feel a spark? I'll get the fireworks. The fireworks will work, okay? On Zoom, we can do more fireworks also. We can do like uh, effects because of uh, the computer. We'll get the, 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 the fireworks emoji on, on you so you can get the sparks going. What does that mean it's not for me? How do you know it's not for you? Why are we so quick? Because you're married to an idea in your head and not a real person. You have a real person in front of you. Stop focusing on the things in your head and start focusing on the real person. If you have someone who suggests a real person to you, take that real person and stop swiping. Start saying, oh, you have anyone else for me? What do you mean anyone else? All you need is one. How many people are you getting married to? I know in this week's Torah portion, you have Yaakov and four wives. You want four wives? Tell me, how many people do you need to get married to? What are your practical tips towards getting out of the mindset of wondering if this is your basharat and getting out of your own mind? Oh, ho, ho. You need some, if you, if you are asking that question, then you need a mentor, a coach, a therapist, somebody that can help you do that. Someone who can help you go through that process. That is a personal process. If it's in your head, you gotta get someone to empty your, empty your head a little bit. Just a little bit, I'm not saying a lot. Someone says, girls don't wanna propose. Well, then you can't have equality, I'm sorry. It's not romantic. I'm sorry, you can't, look, you can't have your cake and eat it too. That's the reality. You asked for equality. And I always say women's lib did everything amazing to the world besides for one thing, it destroyed the nuclear relationship. So this is what we have. This is what we got. You got everything you wanted. Women are in the workplace. There's so many great things. And I'm sorry if I'm not being politically correct, but you got everything, but we lost our nuclear family and now we have to reclaim it. We have to reclaim it. Marriage is a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful thing and it's time to re reclaim it. And if he is too scared to make the move, you make the move, get down on your knee. Okay, don't get down on your knee. Okay, fine, you don't have to be so romantic about it. Just say, would you like to marry me? That ends. That's what happens. 
especially if you're a strong person, you're probably going to be attracted to someone who's less strong. And therefore, you're anyway the one who's the driving force in the relationship. If you're not touching, how do you know if there's any physical chemistry? I'm going to leave that question for a different time. Um, I don't know if I can answer that in 30 seconds because there's a lot of loadedness in that. Let's just say there's ways of doing it. A lot of ways of doing it. What are ways to ask authentic feedback during dating? Authentic feedback. Um, be real. I mean, have a conversation. Just be real. Just start saying the thing. Say the thing. Just, just say, I don't, know if, I don't know if I'm right about this. I'm just going to say this. I don't know if it sits well with me, but I'm just going to say it and I may take it back. Just be real. Allow the process to happen. I move slow and the other person often wants to move fast. Is that an issue that's resolvable? Um, it's too vague. I need more information than that. When we admit what happens and what will change. When we admit what happens, what will change? I'm not sure that question either. Many times it seems the third date see differences that don't work value-wise. Um, I don't know what that means. That you may see differences that don't work value-wise. Third date, that's a lot of boxes. Let's get rid of the boxes. I don't know. Could be, could not be. Stop putting limitations on yourself. You are unlimited. Anything's possible. Just allow the experience to happen. Where are your other sessions? How can I find them? If you signed up for tonight's class, I will send you a link. I'm going to send you, I promised you a questionnaire. I promised you something else. And I, and I will send you a link to other sessions that I've done. My pleasure. Um, I also have a podcast called the Love Rabbi Podcast, and a lot of my classes are on in audio form, and you can find it on, on Google Play, on Apple, and anywhere else you want. And I, many of the classes, I've been doing this for, for 15 years. For a long time, I was giving these classes every single week. So I have many classes on there, and you can go through them. Please elaborate on what you mean, the worst daters are the best husbands. These men won't want don't want to get to know me. They ask no questions. I want someone to learn who I am. Yeah, that's right. Think about it a second. If you can't figure that out, that the worst daters are the best husbands, then question it. Go through the process. You see, sometimes I'm afraid to spoon food. Like You want the 30 seconds or less answer because that's the world we live in. But sometimes some of these things take a process. They really take a process. And so I'm just saying, go through the process. I just threw something out. It, it, it struck you a certain way. Like, wow, you, it hit me somewhere. Okay, now that it hit you, now that you felt it, I want you to go through the process and ask yourself, what did that rabbi mean when he said that the worst daters are the best husbands? What did he mean? Ask that question and start trying to figure out the answer. You got to do, you got to go deeper within yourself. Do a little soul searching. It's okay. Um, is it okay to ask a guy on a date what his flaws are? To know if you can handle it. Um, if I know, I'll know how to deal with it better. He may not always know his flaws. He asks, oh, excuse me, sir. Can I have a question for you? Could you tell me, please? What are your flaws? He may not know them. So, I mean, you can ask him, why not? Be real. Oh, you want me? To, and someone else says, can you send us a list of people's flaws? Why are you so interested in knowing people's flaws? <sighs> okay, I mean, fascinating. Okay. Um, where can I find a real dating coach? Um, if you message me, I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm a real dating coach. I do a lot of dating coaching now. I only have two spots open right now. Um, I only take on a certain amount of people just because of my time restraints. So if you message me, I do have two spots that are available now for dating coaching. And I have a few other dating coaches that I can recommend if I'm not available that uh, I think are really good. Um, is good midot okay to have on the theoretical list or does it need to be more specific? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. 
Hmm. That's a good question. I have to think about that. And again, I don't know if I have an answer for it. Um, I don't like theoretical things in general. I don't like when it comes to dating. I don't like the theoretical. I like practical. So if it's in your head, if it's theoretical, I'm going to vote against it over things that are really in front of you that are real. In general, that's my opinion. If it's real, if it's there, it's good. If it's theoretical in your head, I like what's there more than what's theoretical. Someone says, not for me because I know the person already. How do you know them? Really, what's their favorite color? What did they eat for lunch yesterday? Like, what do you know about them? Even your best friends, how much do you know about them? Like, I don't understand when people say I know them already. What, what is the criteria for I know the person already? In my opinion, if you don't know what their favorite color is and you don't know what they had for lunch yesterday, you don't know them, so you can't say you know them. If you saw them at an event, if you had a, saw them at a speed dating, if you, I don't know, uh, um, I don't, who knows what. If, if, if this is the kind of stuff you're calling, this is what knowing them is, I'm sorry, that's not knowing them. Okay. Um, someone asked if they can reserve a spot for me. So they didn't go, please email me because um, it has to go through Mariana. Actually, even better, you can, you can just uh, email Mariana at jewishmdg.com and she'll, because it has to go on my schedule. It's like a whole official thing. So when, when I do my, uh, my uh, dating coach. Oh yes, Zoom dating games. Yes, I will send you the link for the Zoom dating games. Thank you. Yeah, I, I put a whole thing together for that. And, we're, and I think we're, maybe we'll do a session about that. It sounds like people really want that, how to, how to do proper Zoom dating. Um, how about ask him, what, what's, what, um, what about him bothered his exes? How about ask him, what about him bothered his exes? That's interesting, about flaws. That's a very interesting thought. Okay, I like that. I don't know if that was me about the list of flaws. Can't see my messages anymore. The list I was asking for was the one you mentioned about segulas. Oh, okay, fine, yes. Um, I will send out my mother's list with different segulas. I'll send that in the, in the thing, I have that, okay? I think you have to define what good midot are. I agree. And I think you have to know what those good midot are, what those good things are for yourself. Um, I always wanted someone like my dad. Is that wrong? It's not wrong, but the person is going to be different than your dad if you always wanted someone like your dad. So it's not fair to put that kind of pressure on this other person. Think about if, if, if he was putting that kind of pressure on you and he said, I always wanted someone like my mom, but you're not it. And like, can you be more like my mom? How is that going to make you feel? That's not fair. And what are they to do? Um, yeah. Do you know of any shidduch sites that you recommend? I, I get all these questions about dating sites. Look, you know, I think you have to try everything you can. I developed the site jmontreal.com or jmatchmaking.com. You're welcome to go on it. It doesn't cost anything. If you, if you don't want it to, you just use marketing code rabbi's gift and you can use that. I like it. Um, there's many others. I think you've got to try it all. You, you, have to, you have to put yourself out there. I mean, that's the reality today. We don't have the venues to meet like we used to, especially now. So you got to put yourself out there. You're welcome. If you go onto jmontreal.com and you use marketing code Rabbi's Gift, I will help you out. I have a, a number of matchmakers that I've trained that are also there to help you. If you're not on there, I recommend, highly recommend that you go on there. What if my deal breaker is that I feel comfortable and safe with someone? Is that too vague? I have a hard time communicating that, that to a shadchan, for example. Uh, yeah, it's too vague. Yeah, I don't know what that means, comfortable and safe. I mean, there's probably a lot of, a lot of loaded stuff in there. I would talk to a coach or a therapist before I talk to a, a matchmaker on that one. It is too vague, absolutely. Um, I know, I know it's, 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 this is difficult stuff, but, uh, and, I, and, I, and I, I just wanna say that I'm really honored that, in a, that, I, that you trust me with these private questions of yours. You should know that if you send me a direct message, once this meeting is done, they, they, they get puffed and poofed into oblivion. And they, I never remember them, because, but I do, I do think that it's amazing. And many of the questions that I get from various singles over the course of the week, very, very powerful.
very real, very special. Before we end tonight, um, I want to do one more thing because I find that we we end these kind of sessions and what do we take with us? So I'd love to hear, what are you taking with, it, with you? What's your nugget? Can you write into the comments? What's the one, if there's one nugget that you're taking with you, something you didn't know, and I'm going to prompt you. I now know that, dot, dot, dot. I now know that. Put it in, you can do it as a direct message to me. You can do it as a public message, whatever you want. I now know that. What is the one nugget that I, we spoke about so many different things tonight. Um, we were all over the place tonight. And usually that's what happens because you, you're the ones who kind of guide this process and these, and these sessions. So what is the one thing that you can say one nugget or two nuggets, what are you taking out? Not all at once. I now know that, somebody says, I now know that independence versus attachment is a thing and striking a balance is healthy. Great. I now know that I must make this a priority and make space and clear out the garbage. Fantastic, thank you. I now know that I should give everyone a second chance. I want to give you claps for that. Amazing. I now know that it's okay to discuss engagement. Love that. I now know that be real and give people a chance. Yes. Thank you. This is fantastic. I now know that we should show who we are completely for having a genuine relation to know the reality. Amazing. I now know that. If you want a relationship, you have to work on it. It's a process. Amazing. This is great. What other nuggets? If you have another nugget, please share. I want to put you back in the breakout rooms and I want you guys to talk to each other. <laughs> I, know, I now know that I should let myself be vulnerable. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I now know that the process is hard for everyone. It's true. The process is hard for everyone in their own way. We're all different. We're all unique. If God made us all the same, there'd be nothing to talk about. I thank you all for spending this evening with me. I hope this has been helpful. Um, and uh, it's very, very special. And I thank those of you who have been um, so gracious to, to help and, and support all these things that we're doing and uh, add a donation. Obviously, everything we try to do as much as we can for free. And uh, it's always helpful to add a donation. If you don't have my, my email, my email is rabbi at jewishndg.com. You can always email me, rabbi at jewishndg.com. And uh, somebody asked for a link to be able to make a donation is jewishindg.com slash donate. And uh, it's really, really, really helpful. And thank you. And uh, I know it's, look, it's hard to put yourself out there. It's hard to do all of this, but I think that by just being here tonight, that is the beginning of what we call the Hishtag Lut. That is the beginning of this process of looking. So don't give up. Don't become complacent. Nobody wins by becoming complacent. Don't give up. There's somebody out there for you, I promise you. Really, there is. 